25-year-old school teacher Irene Garza gets ready to leave her parents' house for confession. It was Holy Saturday, day before Easter. Irene was very pious. The church was extremely important to her. One of her last phone calls, and I spoke with Irene. The last thing she said was, I've got a call to see if they're still having confessions because it's kind of late. Irene borrows her parents' car to make the 12 block drive to her family's church in McAllen, Texas. We were all listening to music when one of the cousins walked in and you knew instantly by his face that something was wrong. He asked that all the music be turned off and told us that Irene was missing. All of us go to the church together. Her car is still parked there. What happened? Irene was observed by many witnesses at the Sacred Heart Catholic Church. They saw her walk from her car into the church. They saw her standing in line in the confessional. After eight that evening, no one sees Irene again. Irene was the first Mexican-American twirler in the McAllen High School Band. Never had any before. She became sort of iconic in college with her beauty and her charm and her likability. She graduated from college. She became a teacher in a Mexican-American neighborhood with kids that really needed help. They canvassed the entire area of McAllen. People actually volunteered to help. They had people out on horseback. They had people looking. They found a shoe that had been thrown in a field that had mud. You get that funny feeling in the pit of your stomach that that's just not right, that doesn't feel right. Another day goes by, they find her purse in a field along that same route where they found one of her shoes. They took the purse over to Irene's house where her parents and family members uh, identified. The Thursday after Easter, McAllen police receive a call that a woman's body has been found floating in the Second Street Canal. She was lying in a canal for four days in the mud. You saw her body and how muddy and dirty it was. She's missing her shoes and underwear. The cause of death was asphyxiation without strangulation. Perhaps the most significant finding was there was no water in the lungs. So we knew that she had been killed prior to being dumped in the canal. The autopsy seemed to indicate that she had been sexually assaulted. So they were looking for a male suspect. They actually drained the portion of the canal where she was dumped to see if they could find a murder weapon. And what they found was a Kodak slide viewer where you could put a single slide in it and project that image on the wall. They publish in the paper, if anybody has any information about this slide viewer, please contact us. They received a phone call from John Fight, who was a new, I guess you can call rookie priest at the Sacred Heart Church. John Fight tells the McAllen PD, this slide viewer belongs to me. Father Fight says Irene met him in the rectory for a private confession a little after 7 p.m. Then after he confessed her, he walks her out the door and she goes back across to the church where she went in. And last thing he saw it was Irene putting on her veil. Fight's story raises eyebrows, but he has an alibi. He does the high mass at midnight on Holy Saturday. He does mass on Easter Sunday as well. Since Father Fight is a trusted priest in a religious community, investigative interest in him quickly fades. For months, investigators interviewed 100 different witnesses and suspects, took their statements. Many of them were subjected to polygraph tests. There didn't seem to be any other suspects to the murder. The case went cold. My dad tried to pursue it, but what do you pursue when every person in a law enforcement position 
wants it to go away. In the early 2000s, I made the decision to pursue Irene's case with my cousin, Noemi, in 1960. Her father was a deputy sheriff, and he was part of the team that was investigating Irene's murder. He felt like he knew who had killed her, and he was taken off the case by the sheriff, Vickers, at that time. And it just was unbelievable. Front and center for me was the question, was there DNA evidence that we could process that wasn't available back then that we might be able to do today? And unfortunately, as we went forward, we did not get anywhere uh, with it. Before I started working the case, George Saylor was the cold case detective. George Saylor received a letter from a former monk. And that monk had told him about this priest that had killed a young Hispanic girl on Easter. Uh, according to Dale Tashney, John Fight placed Irene in the basement of the rectory there at the Sacred Heart Church. That's where Irene was locked while he went and heard the rest of the confessions. He had her gagged and bound with a long electrical cord of the Kodak slide viewer. Fight asked the head priest, Father O'Brien, if he could borrow the parish vehicle to go to the pastoral house in San Juan. He took Irene to the pastoral house while the other priests were still busy with the confessional. He put her in a bathtub and also covered her with a uh, plastic, plastic covering. When he left this place, the thing she heard last was, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. According to Dale Tashney, Fight said that after midnight mass, he returned to the pastoral house. He raped Irene then loaded her limp body into the church car. 42 years after the original investigation, Texas Ranger Rudy Jaramillo looks at Father John Fight's alibi with fresh eyes. When they first took him in for questioning, investigators discovered scratches on his hands. John Fight was trying to stay two steps ahead of everybody. He told the authorities that he goes by Whataburger and starts driving aimlessly. But in reality, that was really when he was getting rid of her evidence, the purse and the shoes, and also the uh, body of Irene. That's when he placed her in the canal. After a second look at John Fight's original alibi, Aramillo can see right through it. And he's shocked to learn what the original investigators knew. He did not pass one of them. I mean, he just kept on failing the uh, polygraphs. John Reed believed strongly that John Fight was involved in the murder of Irene Garza. Three weeks prior to Irene going missing, a young lady had been attacked at a Catholic church in Edinburgh, Texas, which is about six miles away. America Guerra had gone to church to pray between classes. As she entered the church, a man came up behind her and with a cloth placed it over her mouth and tried to suffocate her. She bit his finger hard enough that he released her and she got away. Investigators are kind of working that case when two weeks later, Irene's body is found. And they start seeing that there may be a correlation between the two cases. It wasn't until they showed her photographs that America identified John Fight. John Fight pleads no contest to aggravated assault of America Guerra and is fined $500. Prior to him pleading guilty, the church had sent some officials down, and they had made a decision that Fight would be sent off to a monastery and that the punishment would be far greater than what he would receive through the justice system. Included in that was an understanding that the Irene Garza case would not be pursued. So. There's a reason why the case went cold. During the whole investigation, I had a sense that the Catholic Church knew that John Fight had committed the murder, but he was covering up to protect the church. But then again, we couldn't prove anything. My cousin, Noemi's father, he knew 
I think a lot of people knew <laughs> that there had to be collusion to suppress this case. We tried to pursue it, but law enforcement was part of the cabal. With a team of investigators building a case against John Fite, Irene's family points them to a key witness, a man whose silence in 1960 only made them more suspicious of what he knew. The head priest at the time of Irene Garza's murder, Father Joseph O'Brien. Father O'Brien, did anybody tell you Fight committed the murder? He told me. This information came from John Fight himself. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. He tricked John Fight into telling me that he had killed Irene Garza. I said, how can I help you if I don't know what happened? And then he said he bound her and gagged her, and she died of asphyxiation. Confident in the strength of his case, Michael Garza issues an arrest warrant for John Fight. In 2020, only two years into his life sentence, John Fight dies at Huntsville Prison. There was a, a sense of complete closure when he passed. You know, the case was over with and done and, and you know, would never come back. 